Welcome ladies and gentlemen. So what I'd like to do is show you how to determine the domain of a rational function. Now, to determine the domain, it's very important to kind of, again, understand what exactly is the domain of a function. Um, so basically, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of go over two little basic examples that I'll erase here. Example here. So we're going to do with two functions. Uh, the first function will be y equals x squared. And then the other function I'll do is y equals the square root of x. Okay, So just kind of go over two random functions, just to kind of, again, explain, um, to help me explain the definition of domain. So basically, the domain is the set of all input or x values of a graph. So if, you, you know, if we were to graph this using a table, what you can see is um, my graph is going to create this shape. And what's going to happen is it's going to continue going up, and it's going to keep on expanding. So a lot of times when determining the domain, it's important to not always think about you know, what are the values that make up the domain, but what are the values that don't make up the domain? Because those are going to be, more, those are going to be easier to find than trying to find all the values. Because you know, if you look at the point here, let's, um, point, let's look at number at 1. There's a point on the graph. At 2, there's a point on the graph. Well, even remember, a, a graph is made up of infinite many points. So what about 1.5? Yeah, that's on the graph. 1.25? Yep. 1.1? Yep. So there's infinite many points between the, between the x coordinate 1 and the x coordinate uh, are, are people that, that, yeah, the coordinate of 1 and 2 for the x value. So the domain is, contains all the points between 1 and 2. It goes to 0. It goes to negative 1, negative 2. And the arrows say it's going to keep on expanding. So as my, if I was going to continue this graph and I kept on getting to larger and larger um, x values, I would always have a point on this graph because the graph is also always expanding. So the, the domain of this would be all real numbers, or negative infinity to positive infinity. Um, when you look at the, the graph of y equals square root of x, that just looks like, that looks something like this. So you can see that for positive x values, I'm always going to have a point that's going to rise. And if I keep on going to the right, this graph is going to keep on going to the right. However, my domain falls a little short here as I go to the left. Because you can see that the farthest this graph goes to the left is at 0. I don't have any negative numbers um, in my domain. Or neg not any negative numbers, like negative 1, there's no point on this graph where x equals negative 1. Same thing with negative 2 and so forth. So do my domain is only, um, my own domain only um, accounts for positive x values. So I could rewrite that as. Um, 0, comma, infinity. And I use a bracket because that's going to be included. And infinity, you, know, you can't include infinity, so that's why we're going to use a parenthesis. Or you could just say you know, x is greater than or equal. Uh, you could also write it like this, x such that x is greater than or equal to 0. And I'm going to show, I'm going to, when I write the domain, I'm going to write it in multiple different formats. Um, so therefore, that you can um, see which ones, you know, which ones work, which one, or which ones you might encounter. And also for a test, you might have different ones. So that's the basic definition. So when we're looking into rational functions, um, you know, we're going to get into how to graph them and so forth. Um, we're going to get to how to graph them and so forth. But um, again, as I said earlier, a lot of times, rather than trying to identify what the graph looks like and what's going to be a part of the domain, a lot of times it's easier to identify what is not a part of the domain. Now, ooh, I should have kept that over there. There's two common things that we look at when we're um, graphing functions f of x equals the square root of x, and f of x equals 1 over x. Now, remember, in this example, we couldn't have any negative values. Why didn't we have any negative values in our graph? Well, you can't take the even root, um, in this case, the square root of a negative number. So anytime you have a negative number in, under a even or square, or square root, you can't take it. It's not a part of the domain. Also, in this example, I have f of x equals 1 over x. Well, what would not be a part of this graph? Any time that x is equal to 0, that's not going to be a part of your domain. 0 is not going to be a part of the domain in the denominator because you can't divide a number by 0. So two examples, two examples. you cannot take this even root of a negative number, nor can you divide by 0. So you look in these examples here, I have four rational, four rational functions. So basically, what I'm going to look for, I'm not dealing with radicals in this case. What I'm looking for is, when is the denominator going to be 0? When the denominator is equal to 0, those values are not going to be a part of my domain, because they're going to make the denominator 0, so they're not going to be in the domain. So basically, to determine the domain, 
Forget about what's in the domain. Let's focus on what's not in the domain. And what's not in the domain is going to be when my denominator is equal to 0. So what you're basically going to do for all of these problems is set your denominator equal to 0, because the values that make your denominator equal to 0 are not going to be a part of your domain. So I can quickly add here, and I can say x is equal to 7. So there's a couple different ways to um, kind of write this. Basically, we have all numbers. All numbers here are um, all numbers it, are going to be included except for the number 7. But every other number is a part of your domain. So since 7 is not included, we could write this in um, set notation using, uh, we could say, negative infinity. So all numbers to negative infinity all the way to 7. 7 is not included, so I'm going to use a parentheses. Then I'm going to union that with, again, 7 not being included all the way to infinity. Okay? Or we could say that it's going to be x such that, so all real numbers such that x cannot equal positive 7. Okay? So just kind of two different ways to write really basically the exact same problem. Um, so exactly here now, now we have the product of two binomials. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to set them equal to 0. So I'll have x plus 3 times x minus 1, set it equal to 0, because again, I want to determine what values are going to make it equal to 0. To solve this, we can apply the zero product property. So I can set x plus 3 equal to 0, or x minus 1 equal to 0. Solve. I have x equals negative 3 and x equals 1. Therefore, all real numbers um, are going to be a part of the domain except for negative 3 and 1. So I'm going to go from negative infinity. The first thing I'll get to is negative 3. Union, negative 3 all the way up to 1. Union, 1 to infinity. Or if you'd like to use it um, in this notation, you could also go or the set notation, x such that x cannot equal negative 3 and x cannot equal 1. Okay, And you might say, well, that one's much easier. Why don't you just use that? Well, it's very common, actually, in our course that we use um, this notation. So I want to make sure that I include that for all of my videos. Okay, so now, basically, what we have is x squared minus 64. So I set that equal to 0. Just want to be clear with people. Well, there's two different ways you could use this. Um, first of all, you could use the square root method. So basically, what you could do is just solve using inverse operations. Even though this is a quadratic, I only have one variable, which is x squared. So I can set it to the other side, equals 64. Then I'll take the square root, square root, x equals plus or minus 8. It's very important. I wanted to show that because a lot of students will take the square root of 64 and say, oh, it's 8. But remember, it's plus or minus. Why? Well, remember, you could also do this as the difference of two squares. This can be factored as x minus 8 times x plus 8. Then you could say x minus 8 equals 0 and x plus 8 equals 0. So you'd have x equals negative 8 or x equals, oops, I'm sorry, positive 8 or x equals negative 8. So you can see if you do it this way, you get positive and negative. Here, a lot of students forget the positive and negative because they take the square root, but they only include the positive. So that's why I wanted to show it both ways. Um, Da, 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 da. OK, and also notice that the plus 8, that would actually be a whole, which we'll talk about later. Um, that will divide out. And then this would actually be your only asymptote. But either way, these two values, since they make the denominator equal to 0, are not going to be a part of our solution. So again, we could write it like this. So we could go negative um, infinity to negative 8, union, negative 8 to positive 8, union, positive 8 to infinity. Or we could say the solution is all real numbers of x such that x cannot equal negative 8 and x cannot equal positive 8. OK, so the last example here, I have h of x equals x minus 2 divided by x squared minus 8x plus 7. One thing I forgot to mention, notice I haven't done anything with the numerator. When determining the domain, we don't care anything about the numerator. We're only concerned about what is, what is going to make, um, what is not going to be a part of our, fu of our function, of our domain. Um, and the only time that we have that that, we've just, that I've showed you is when you take the square root of a negative number, which there's no square roots or even roots, or when the denominator is equal to 0. So we don't care about the numerator. We just care about when the denominator is equal to 0. x squared minus 8x plus 7 
equals 0. So this one was linear. That was easy. This was already factored zero product property, so that was easy. This one, we had to factor or use square root method. This one, we have to factor or use the quadratic formula. Fortunately, this is factorable. We don't have to use the quadratic formula. So I'd have x squared minus 8x plus 7 equals 0. Um, so I can factor what two numbers multiply to give you 7, add to give you negative 8. That's going to be minus 7 and negative 1. So I'll write x minus 7 times x minus 1 equals 0. Now I apply the zero product property like I did before. And therefore I have x equals 7 and x equals positive 1. So I can say my domain is from negative infinity to positive 1, union 1 to 7, union 7 to infinity. Or I could say my domain is all real numbers x such that x cannot equal 7 and x cannot equal 1. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That is how you determine the domain of a rational function. Thanks.